Uh, most of you know that the computers around here, most of them are uh, Mac-based, they're Apple-based. And one of the programs that uh, Apple has is a program called Time Machine. And what's fascinating about Time Machine is you can ultimately kind of go back and look at stuff that you forgot that you had. The, the way Time Machine works, it's an automated method for backing up files so they can be retrieved when necessary. And so when you go into it, all of a sudden you see this thing and you go back. You can go back years. In my case, I go back eons. You see how this works, you see. Now, the real question, of course, is why does such a program exist and what's its value? Time Machine is valuable because sometimes we delete stuff a.k.a. we forget things that we've previously done that are nonetheless important for what's happening right now. They're valuable and instructive. Or here's the proverb, we revisit the past in order to reorder the present. We study the lessons of God's people in the past in order to see more clearly his plans for our present and future. God is an eternal God. He doesn't live within time. He lives outside of it. And so the things he wants to teach us that for us seem sequential in the past are nonetheless eternal realities that exist in the present right now. So this morning we're going back into our study of the book of Judges to look at one of those early issues that will help us not only understand why Israel declined, but why that's potentially true in our life and our culture as well. We're looking at the life and legacy of Deborah and her compatriot Barak. Now let me just set the stage. If you have your outlines in the praise and prayer shoot, you note that I'm a relatively simple guy and I've got three points that you want you to remember. You can forget everything else, got the three points, okay? That Deborah is a judge, first of all, who sees. She's given a vision of what God wants his people to know and to understand. She's a prophetess. She sees into the plan and purpose of God. The application's clear. We all as people are given by God by virtue of his word and the people that God raises up insight as to how God looks at our life. We're not alone in this one, friend. Secondly, Deborah sends. The vision God gives does not render her passive, but active in making things happen. And you'll see in the outline, her sending has two components. She sends for, and she sends forth. We come here to hear what God's vision is for our life, and then we leave here to go out there and make it happen. We need to be sent for in order to hear. Sunday by Sunday, Tuesday by Tuesday, Wednesday by Wednesday, daily as we meet with God. And thirdly, Deborah sings. She writes this amazing poem of praise that celebrates the victory of God both personally and corporately. And friends, we need to do the same thing. Now you'll recognize the logic of this is pretty patently clear. It's cyclical, an argument. You hear the vision of God, it motivates what you do, and then when you see God act, you sing back to God, and you keep going around in a circle. That's the logic of the day. Now let's kind of spread this out and unpack it a bit by looking at some selected verses in Judges chapter 4, reading verse 1. After Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Haguim. Because he had 900 iron chariots and cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and, and, and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. Let's stop just for a bit, a couple comments. First of all, she sees her place within the Israelite social order. Boy, a background, the Bible mentions many women, several, at least three or four, who are known as prophetesses. 
Moses' sister Miriam is a prophetess who helps them understand the great victory in the Exodus, Exodus chapter 15. There's a prophetess in 1 Kings 22 named Huldah. There's a prophetess named Noadiah in, Jeremiah, in Nehemiah 6. Some of you remember Anna, the prophetess who appears in the temple when Jesus has brought his little baby, arms of Mary. She prophesies what's going to happen so that Jesus' parents won't be caught by surprise. The function of the prophet or the prophetess is to listen to the voice of God and provide specific, specific information about God's divinely inspired plan and instruction. Usually, at least back then, and in some cases even today, in three areas. The first is of moral dilemmas. I don't know what I ought to do. So folk would come to Deborah as uh, she's sitting under the palm of Deborah, and she would say, this is what God is saying you ought to do, moral dilemmas. Sometimes it's military decisions, as we'll see in a bit. She sends for Barak to organize the army, to take advantage of it, a unique opportunity to free God's people. And then there's particular directions not covered by the Mosaic law. In other words, God gave Moses the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And apart from then, there were other decisions that might need to be made, and God would give specific information to these people to know what's going on. Now let me back away just a bit. Understand that the role of the prophet or the prophetess took place against the backdrop of two other roles in 13th century BC Jewish society. The first was that of the Levites. The Levites were a tribe and out of them came priests. They were a priestly tribe and their job was twofold, to mediate for God's people into his presence sacrifices that expressed the praises of God. The second thing they were to do was to educate God's people as to the nature of the Mosaic Law. And the Levites were spread throughout the land among 42 different towns in ancient Israel so that this educative and mediatorial kind of function could take place. The Levites didn't own lots of property but were dependent on God's people for supply and support. Their responsibility was to represent the people before the land so that... God could ultimately receive the praises that he deserved. And then they were to teach how that worked. In each of the towns and villages, there was a second class of folk. They were called elders. Barak is probably one of them. He's raised up as an elder who's also the commander of an organized militia. Elders functioned at the city gates to basically enact certain decisions of a civil nature, land disputes. Even to the case of, for the, uh, we looked before, cities of refuge where people ultimately were accused of crimes they didn't commit. Elders had a kind of power function to enact how things should work within the local towns. And then prophets or prophetesses, and they provided the perspective that God wanted to give his people. Now here's the huge point, huge point. God so arranged each of these three roles so that power would not reside in one class or one person. There's a democratization of the civil, political, and religious power of Israel so that no one person or class, like the Egyptians, like the Babylonians, like the Canaanites, would ultimately reside everything in the priest, the pharaoh, or the king. God did not want that kind of concentration of power. Do you know why? Because he's the king. Now friends, two points of application. You understand where this fits for our country politically, Memorial Day. The reason for the three branches of government is because they were created by people who were sensitive to the fact that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, amen. Friends, the reason for the three branches of government is so that God will himself be the head of this country. One nation under. And friends, that means your responsibility as citizens is to evoke and maintain that he is in charge. The same thing's true, not just on a civil level, but on a church level. 
God has so gifted the members of this body such that power doesn't reside just in the elders, just in the old folk, just in the people who are bald and beautiful. You know, it doesn't work that way, you see. Some of you are laughing because you identify. You see how this works, you see. Why? Because Paul says that one member of the body can't dismiss another. Our responsibility is to understand our place and our purpose within the body because together we all affirm and reflect that Jesus is Lord. The decentralization of decision-making occurs not only within countries but within churches such that it's important for you to hear what God's saying so that the leaders of the church, the elders, will be able to lead effectively. Know what Deborah does. She sees, and she sees God's perspective on the opportunities for doing his work. She sees three things. She sees the strengths of God's enemies can be turned into weaknesses. It says in the text that Sisera had 900 chariots. They were the Abram's tank of the 14th century B.C. Led by two, three, four horses with wheels on the side with size. They could mow down anything that got in their way. He doesn't have one. He doesn't have 100. He's got 900 of them. But Deborah sees a weakness. And it's mentioned, we won't look at it in particular, but in the song that she does in the next chapter, she sees that God can turn that, weak, that strength into weakness by virtue of the fact that God controls the weather. <laughs> and when the rains come, the chariots can't go nowhere fast. <laughs> Deborah understands that strength comes from God alone. And two, this sad strategy can be seized on even amid fear. She recognized that Sisera thinks he's hottest stuff on the planet right then. And he can be lured into what's going on. Deborah sees the weakness and hubris of God's enemies that can be used against them. And thirdly, Deborah sees that security lies in God, not in God's people. And here's Barak's problem. Barak betrays a kind of unmanly leadership problem. We'll see a bit more in the next section. But note at first blush that Barak doesn't really see what Deborah sees. In a word, he's a weak-kneed, lily-livered wuss of a general. That's what he is. Let's read on. Verse 6. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh, Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will, note the word, lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, I will go... If you go with me, I will go. What a guy. <laughs> but if you don't go with me, I'm staying home and pouting. No, no, that's not what it says. But you understand the sense here. Very well, Deborah said, I will go with you. But because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, where he summoned Zebulun and Naphtali. 10,000 men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. He, Deborah, sends for Barak and invites her, him to listen to God's message through. And note that Deborah doesn't say that she's the one sending. It's the Lord that's commanding Barak to do it. We've said it many times before. The authority of Deborah isn't intrinsic. It's derived. It comes because God has given her a message that she's relaying to somebody else. And then secondly, as a result of this message, she not only sends for Barak, but sends him forth. Go organize. Go do it. But he's only going to go forth if Deborah go with him. Yeah, I, lots of things being suggested here. I think, first of all, Barak's just afraid. He's fearful. Because I think Barak looks at those 900 chariots and says, you have no clue what it's like to stand in front of them. Can I speak candidly here, guys? One of the things that's true, guys, is oftentimes we see the obstacle before we see the opportunity. <laughs> and all too often, all right, I'm speaking for me, all too often, I'm afraid. 
Secondly, he's faithless. Barak's not trusting in the Lord who's working through Deborah. He's trusting only what he could see, not what he couldn't see. And as a result, he hides behind the skirt of Deborah. Now understand the point that's being made here. It's, it's a critical point. You've got to get this. If this is true of the commander of the army, what do you think it says about the army itself? Duh. If this is true of the fighting men of Israel, what do you think it says about those they represent? And what's happening here is that the judge's writer is saying that people who don't trust in the Lord don't know who that God is, ending up being feeble, frail, and faithless. Let's read on. Verse 11. Now Heber the Canaanite had left the other Canaanites, descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law. Lots of it now. There's a chronology here. And pitched his tent by the great tree in Zinnim near Kadesh. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera gathered his 900 iron chariots and all his men with them from Haroshet Haroshet Haguim in the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go! This is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not God gone ahead of you? So Barak went down to Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. At Barak's advance, note what's said next. The Lord routed Sisera. Not, not Barak doing it, not the men doing it, the Lord does it. All his chariots and army by the sword. Sisera abandoned his chariot and fled on foot, but Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harosheth Hagwim. All the troops of Sisera fell by the sword, not a man was left. Great thing. The battle's enjoined, success is realized, and the text declares again and again and again that the Lord routed Sisera, and Deborah's vision is confirmed. And then there's this curious postscript of what takes place. Follow along. I'm reading verse 17 and following. Sisera, however, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, wife of Heber the Kenite, because there were friendly relationships between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the clan of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered a tent, and she put a covering over him. Isn't she acting really nice? Some of you know what's coming on. You know what's happening. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here? Say, no. What moral exemplar this guy is. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and lest you are unsure of what happens next, it says, and he died. Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, he said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in to, with her, and there lay Sisera with a tent peg through his temple, dead. You catch, there must be no subtlety here, right? I mean, they really want you to know what's going on. On that day, God subdued Jabin, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites, and the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, the Canaanite king, until they destroyed him. Jael violates virtually all the tenets of Near Eastern hospitality. And commentators fall all over themselves by declaring somewhat tongue-in-cheek that Sisera died of a splitting headache. You see, I mean, this is the way this stuff goes. Now, let me back away for a bit here. You understand what's being said behind the scenes in the text here. You understand that the writer of the Judges Chronicle is saying that the leadership of Deborah and Jael is a sign or symptom of Israel's decline, not a symbol of Israel's strength. 
The fact that the women are leading is showing you how bad things are in Israel. Because the normative pattern, I know I'm on dangerous ground, but bear with me here, friends. The normative pattern in the biblical thing is that men are to lead and love fearlessly. Their model, their hero is Jesus, who loved to the point of dying for us. Men are to lead in such a way that they give up their life for those they lead in whatever sphere of life it is. And women are to nurture and prompt faithfully by promoting God's people, to, prompting God's people to follow him and to those he raises up. Their leadership model is Jesus who submitted to his Father in heaven. Both men and women are to be team players in this deal. It's a power neutral environment. Now, there are other exceptions all over the place to the normative pattern. And it's sometimes God raises up women because men are wusses and don't do it. They're barrack-like. That doesn't violate the pattern itself. When men and women do not embrace God's plan for their life and pattern for relationships, men become abusers, withdrawn, self-absorbed, and uncommitted and distant in the great kingdom work of God. Ultimately, they become like Barak, fearful, faithless, and victories right in their grasp, and they don't have a clue how to do it. I speak because I'm guilty of that stuff. In the normative pattern, women who don't follow the Lord become manipulative, critical, heartless, and unloving. And ultimately, they become cruel, cold, and harsh. But God's work will not be stilled, and God will raise up a witness to speak and do his work. The great plan works when God's people, men and women, function the way he wants. When God's men fail to lead, God will raise up any one of a number of other leaders. When God's women fail to follow, God will raise up another generation of followers. We live in an age that proclaims gender fluidity. You can determine what sex you want to be. That's contrary to the plan and purpose of God. God is the one who determines our identity before we're even born. And the church history is replete with women God has raised up to do what men didn't do. No power issues at all. Let me illustrate. About 10 years ago, uh, we were visiting my uh, oldest son and daughter-in-law in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. That's where they lived. And we went to one of their church services, Lancaster County Bible Church, for a Thanksgiving s service. It was a big church. A church grew, started in 1985. has about 8,000 members now. So it's kind of one of those deals. Well, we got there. Uh, Todd and Jen, were, they were involved. They had signed up to do nursery care for one of the myriad of little munchkins that kind of were running up and down this hallway. You know how this works, you see. So we got there figuring, okay, we would drop them off, drop off the grandkids, and then go participate in the service. And all of a sudden we realized that they didn't have enough nursery staff. So someone came up to my wife and I and said, could you stay and help us out? They didn't have a clue who I was. You could run imagine with what they thought, you see. So I was put in charge of one little munchkin who was about six months old. And that kid did not want to be in church that night. In fact, screaming her bloody head off is what she was doing. And they stuck me in a dimly lighted room and I walked back and forth for a half an hour singing Amazing Grace, mumbling it to her. And after a while, she fell asleep. They all came, you did a great job. How did you put her to sleep? I said, I do it regularly on Sunday mornings. You know how this works, you see. <laughs> Guys, little kids need men. Little boys need men. Teens need men. And the legacy, the DNA of this place is that men and women work in team 
raising the next generation. And if you don't hear God calling you, you're not listening. Because Deborah saw an opportunity. Encouraged Barak to see it and was sent to do it. And he blew it. God was not dismayed. But the normative pattern is let's be team players for the greater glory of God's kingdom. And all God's people must say, Amen. We won't have time to look at it in detail, but as a result of all this, Deborah sings. It's an amazing song. And we'll look at it just in brief things. That what she does, she structures the song into three kind of stanzas that have three different kinds of comparisons. The first one is verses 2 to 8, where she compares and contrasts the power of the Lord with the poverty of his people. He says, among other things, you are in such good shape that if, uh, bad shape that if God wasn't involved, you wouldn't have a clue. In fact, he says, among other things, that those days were so bad that the roads were abandoned, verse 6, and travelers took to winding paths. You were so afraid that you didn't even walk on the roads. But God's bigger than your poverty. Any great work within a church community must begin with the greatness of God. The second stanza of Deborah's thing compares and contrasts fearless warriors, those who respond to his call, and this fearful brother. Verse 12, Deborah says, wake up, Deborah, wake up, wake, wake up and break into song. In other words, Deborah's alone back at home waiting to see what's going on. And the words come, the victory's coming. So she sings to herself, wake up, it's time to sing. And then in the next time she says, arise, O Barak. I mean, Barak, you're clueless. Get a clue. Victory's yours. And God works even in spite of the frailty and fearfulness of his leaders. The last stanza is verse 24 to the end. And here two women are compared in contrast. One is Jael, who's called blessed because she took what was right before. Women in those days were responsible for the setting up of the tents. They were the ones who knew how to wield the, the tent pegs and the mallets. They were strong. They were nobody's fool. And so when Jael takes that tent peg and puts it through Sisera's temple, she knows what she's doing. And it's compared and contrasted with Sisera's mom who's waiting at home, waiting for him to come back, and he'll never make it. As a result, the last verse of the song says these words, So may all your enemies perish, O Lord. But may they who love you be like the sun when it rises in its strength. In other words, those people who hear God speak ultimately become like God in spreading his influence throughout the whole world. They become sun-like, reflecting the greatness of God, reflecting his light, his heat, and his health. So Deborah's story begins with a vision that sees past the obstacles of life. It then begin, goes to a, a kind of sending, both coming and going, and ultimately results in a song that celebrates the greatness of God. Brothers and sisters, are you part of the same team? <laughs> are you people who have heard God speak and see his vision for this world? Have you come today in order to hear what God's saying so that you'll be sent out and not be weak, needy, little, whatever, but be strong, playing the team as strong men and women? And then finally, will you be folk that sing and let other people hear your song that God is great? Let's pray together. Lord, we want to ask that you would take this story centuries old and make it contemporary in our lives. Would you allow us to be people who are not afraid but fearlessly follow your vision? 
Help us to be folk who care for not only the next generation, but generations to come to celebrate the greatness of our God. We'll pray in the name of Jesus, and all God's people will say,